Welcome to Polyunsaturated Fat, Obesity, and Designer Pork Fat. I am Brad Marshall, the author of Fire in a Bottle and the founder of Firebrand Meats. So I want to talk about there is a there's an idea that um, that the obesity epidemic began in America, which I think that it did. Um, and the reason for this is that uh, our food has become too palatable. We have things like Doritos and you know Coca Cola. Um, round the clock availability and that um, these kind of hyper palatable foods overwhelm our hypothalamus and they cause us to overeat and Americans have eaten more and more and more um, over the past several decades. And that this is the reason for the obesity epidemic. Um, and, and the problem that I have with it is that it, it sort of fails to uh, explain anything about, actual historical trends. Um, one of the things, it's famously difficult as a nutritionist to figure out how much calories, how many calories people actually eat because you give them like a 24 hour dietary recall and they're supposed to write down everything they ate in the past 24 hours, but people are not very good at judging portion sizes. You know, they forget the midnight snack that they had, etc. And so I like to use um, economic data, uh, FAO stat, um, is a great resource. And, and what it gives you is it gives you how much food a given country went through in a year. Um, and countries are really good at tracking this. The, the most, you know, governments track all the imports of wheat flour, exports of wheat flour, how much wheat flour we produced, you know, and then from that, you can figure out how much people must have eaten or wasted, right? So some of the food is wasted. But uh, in my opinion, when you're comparing to, you know, America and France, for instance, which we're about to do, um, I can't see any reason why there would be huge differences in food wastage between America and France. And maybe somebody has a great idea for why that is. But um, if you do get a hold of me anyway, um, so this is obesity rates in in the U.S. and in a bunch of um, European countries, also Korea. Um, over the past few decades, sorry, the font's a little small, but this uh, is 1970, uh, here's 1980, here's 1990. And so you can see that by 1990, the U.S. is already at 20 plus percent obesity um, in the adult population. France is way down at 6%. And this line here, even below France, is uh, Switzerland. They're down at about 5% by 1990. And so you say, well, the Americans must have been overeating by 1990, right? Um, or even before. I mean, we would have had to have been eating overeating by 1970, really, um, to be this far ahead of the curve. And so, do um, were Americans eating uh, more as the obesity epidemic started? And in fact, they clearly were not. Um, in fact, especially compared to Switzerland, um, between 1961 and 1970. Uh, the Swiss were going through an extra 500 calories per day compared to Americans, right? So the lean Swiss, um, who are at 5% obesity by 1990, um, have been eating this huge amount of calories all along and they never became obese. Right. And so that's, um, so that's, a, that's a problem for the calories theory of obesity. Um, Another problem for the calories of theory of obesity, and I don't really have a slide about this, but I just read um, Herman Ponzer's book, Burn, and he talks about the act, like the fact that it, you don't actually burn that many, as many more calories as you think that you do by exercising. So everybody will look at this and say, well, Europeans walk more. Um, and he talks about a study where uh, people train to run a marathon. So people who have never been trained before prepare to run a marathon, and at the end, um, they're jogging 20 miles, 25 miles a week. And this happens over about a year and, um, they do their total energy expenditure that they're, that they're, um, using before training at all. And then the total calorie expenditure after training and the difference, even while they're jogging these 25 miles a week is only about 120 calories a day. Um, your body kind of has ways of compensating for the fact that you're doing increased physical activity. So, you know, when you see a caloric deficit like this of 500 calories a day, um, it just simply can't be explained 
by extra physical activity uh, based on the best data that we ha that we have. So there's got to be something else going on. Um, this is polyunsaturated fat consumption. Uh, you can see the, the blue line again is America. Uh, the red line is France. You can see polyunsaturated, and this is um, sunflower oil and soybean oil because most of the world mostly eats soybean oil as a, as a high proof of oil. France, for whatever reason, loves sunflower oil, but they're similar in composition. But, but you can see uh, vegetables don't really enter the French diet until around 1968. Um, and the Swiss ate some vegetable oils, but very low compared to the U.S. Um, you know, the U.S. is up at uh, 300 calories a day, even by, um, you know, even by 1975. And that's a lot. Um, the U.S. is at 400 calories by 1982. And the Swiss uh, calories from vegetable oil never go over 150. And in fact, they drop after 1980 back down to a baseline level of about 100. And so, the French and Swiss are just eating far less vegetable oil than we are and far more calories. And, you know, we're the obese ones. Um, and before I do that slide, I just want to show you this. And so you can show in the lab um, these mice. So these mice were given, they're identical mice uh, genetically. They were given a diet that was the same in everything, except that mouse B, which is notably obese, was given 8% of its calories as linoleic acid vegetable oil. Um, this is the amount of calories that mouse B and mouse A ate. And as you can see, it's identical. So these are identical mice. Everything is the same. This one got 8% of calories as linoleic acid, and it got fat. This one got 1% of calories as linoleic acid, and it did not get fat. You know, calories did not do this. Just like they couldn't have done it in America, as compared to Switzerland, right? Um, just going to go back to the slide for a second. So uh, this this whole seminar, of course, is on uh, fats and the future of fats. And so I just want to make sure that um, you'll probably hear these terms, uh, but I just want to make sure everyone knows what I'm talking about. Uh, PUFA is polyunsaturated fat. Um, these are liquid oils. They mostly come from vegetable sources. Um, they have multiple double bonds. Linoleic acid is by far the most common one. Um, corn oil, sunflower oil, soybean oil are the main sources of linoleic acid typically, but uh, linoleic acid also accumulates when you feed it to animals. So um, you can get quite a bit of linoleic acid from uh, sources like uh, pork and chicken as well. Um, monounsaturated fats are liquid at room temperature, things like olive oil, avocado oil, uh, and even schmaltz and lard, schmaltz is chicken fat and, and lard is pork fat. Uh, schmaltz and lard are predominantly monounsaturated fat. Uh, also, um, bone marrow is very high in monounsaturated fat, interestingly. Um, oleic acid is the most common monounsaturated fat by far. And then you have saturated fats. These are hard at room temperature. Things like beef tallow, cocoa butter, and coconut oil are some of the most saturated natural fats that we have. Um, beef tallow can be up and, and cocoa butter can be up to like two thirds saturated and coconut oil can be as high as 90% uh, saturated or more. Um, we already saw this slide. Um, so what is the evolutionary reason for this? Um, I'm going to try. Uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, that's my little reminder. Uh, this song is hot blooded by foreigner. I'm not going to subject you to it. Um, but what I want to say is that um, you know, when mammals evolved a warm blooded metabolism, that gives us a lot of advantages. You know, uh, we're not like snakes. We don't have the sun on a rock before we can get around, you know? Um, and so, but the disadvantage is it takes a lot more calories to have a warm blooded metabolism. And so built into our system, um, for times of scarcity, we have the ability to enter something called a torpid metabolism, where we can actually slow that metabolism down and burn less calories for times of shortage, such as winter, etc. cetera. Um, and so this, uh, this article, breaking news, the influence of dietary fatty acids on hibernation by golden mantled ground squirrels. I believe this is a 1992 paper. Um, it's not really a news article. I, we made it look fancy. Um, and and what, the, what the article basically shows 
is if you take an American um, squirrel who is uh, foraging donuts and fried chicken out of a dumpster uh, versus a French squirrel who is foraging behind a patisserie uh, and is eating butter croissant out of the dumpster. Um, and then it gets cold. Winter is oncoming. The days are coming shorter. You fast them. You take the food away. What happens is uh, the American squirrel who was able to eat enough um, linoleic acid is able to lower its metabolic rate and hibernates. Uh, it goes into torpor and it hibernates. The French squirrel uh, fails to go into torpor. Um, it totally fails to hibernate and it burns off its entire winter store of fat in nine days. Um, and you know, those slides are funny, but this is a real, this is a real experiment that was done. Um, so if you feed the squirrels, uh, if the squirrels were fed one and a half percent linoleic acid, they had 10% linoleic acid in their body fat content. And those are the squirrels that burned off their winter supply of fat in nine days. Uh, if you give them a medium amount of linoleic acid, about 3% in the diet, their body fat builds up to about 18%. Three out of four of those entered torpor, but two of them woke up early and one of them died in mid winter. And so none of them were able to make it through hibernation either. So, so essentially in evolutionary terms, all eight of those squirrels would have died. Um, Whereas the squirrels who got 8% of linoleic acid in their diet, they build up to 30% in their body fat and four out of four of those squirrels actually were able to enter torpor and hibernate. So um, this polyunsaturated fat, we've been known for a long time, polyunsaturated fat is necessary for a torpid metabolism. Um, and you're saying, well, I'm not a squirrel, uh, but uh, these are all of the mammals who can hibernate or who can enter torpor, basically. Um, these are monotremes. These are um, spiny anteaters and things like uh, duckbill platypuses. They lay eggs, right? They're considered mammals because they have hair, but they lay eggs. Um, these are marsupials. Of course, you all know what marsupials are. They don't have a placenta. They have a pouch. And then these are placental mammals. Um, and the reason I point this out is to see, to show how broadly uh, conserved torpor is throughout the mammalian family. Um, presumably the, the original mammal that we all evolved from had already, uh, had already figured out, uh, how to do torpor. And in fact, there is a primate, uh, the gray lemur or the dwarf lemur who can, uh, who does go into torpor and hibernate. So we have hibernating mammals very close to us on the mammalian family tree. Um, you a mammal, bruh. Um, and this is the uh, dwarf lemur, which is, of course, the, the most closely related mammal to us who can enter torpor. And this is a spiny anteater, the most distant mammal to us that can enter torpor. Um, so here's another fun fact. As squirrels want to go into torpor, another thing that they do, in addition to eating polyunsaturated fat, they increase the expression of this enzyme called SCD1. And what SCD1 does is it introduces a double bond into saturated fat. So there are two ways to get your fat unsaturated. One is to eat PUFA. Um, another one is to increase this enzyme called SCD1. Um, so these squirrels are going to have very unsaturated body fat because, because they're accumulating PUFA, but they're also uh, turning their saturated fat into MUFA, monounsaturated fat. Whoops. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, that was, I missed that slide, but all it says is SCD1 turns saturated fat into monounsaturated fat. SCD1 unsaturates body fat. Important points. Okay. Uh, animals cannot make PUFA. This is another important point. Um, we can only make, uh, if, if an animal eats starch or sugar or ethanol, um, it can only make saturated fat through the first step of de novo lipogenesis. Um, then the amount of, of, so your amount of fat saturation winds up ending up on, you know, two things, the amount of polyunsaturated fat in your diet and the amount of SCD1 that you make. Um, those are the most important points. Um, so why is that important? Well, this is, um, this is a graph of oxygen consumption. Whoops. Um, 
this is a graph of oxygen consumption of mice who actually don't have the enzyme SCD1. And so this is that mouse here, the SCD minus mouse, and you can see saturated fat is 73% of that mice's fat is saturated. That's a really high number. I've never seen that number in any kind of natural system. And what's interesting is these mice have a metabolic rate that's something like 40% higher than a normal mouse. And they're protected uh, for their whole lifetime against obesity and diabetes. Um, and they're lean. And so, you know, that's a really interesting statement. And I've compared them to uh, what I call a starch eating human. Of course, there are human cultures around the world who live primarily on starch. And what I mean is uh, Asian rice farmers, um, African sorghum farmers, uh, South American um, uh, people who live on yucca, uh, manioc. Um, you know, there are lots of lots of cultures around the world where farmers are raising, uh, you know, starchy plants, and that's their primary diet. And and those. Amer or the, not those Americans, but those people tend to have a uh, fairly saturated body fat, not compared to these mice, but they have very, very fatted, saturated body fat, and they tend to have a higher metabolic rate than other humans, just like the mice who cannot unsaturate their fat. So that's interesting. And here's an example of this. So this is, um, this was done by Fred Stair, who was actually an early supporter of eating polyunsaturated fats. Um, they went to a Nigerian tribe and 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 tested, um, you know, looked at their the fat they had, and you can see it's um, it's a pretty uh, saturated blend: uh, forty percent saturated fat, fifty percent mufa, and a little under ten percent pufa. And this is a pretty common. You'll see this pattern again later uh, in the talk. And this is an American. Uh, these were men from Indiana around that same time period, and you can see the Americans actually have. Um, less saturated body fat than the, than the starch eating culture, which I think is interesting. And then here's an obese American in 2012. Um, you know, polyunsaturated fat has doubled. Monounsaturated fat is, has continued to increase and saturated fat has absolutely uh, plummeted. And this last line that my head is blocking, this is stearic acid. So stearic acid is a specific 18 uh, carbon length fat and it is readily converted by SCD1 into oleic acid. And so stearic acid is sort of an indicator of how much of this enzyme that you make. And you can see the starch eating cultures have almost 10% stearic acid. The American in 1962 has 6.7% and the obese American has under 4%. Um, so you can see that the stearic acid uh, comes off pretty quickly with obesity and um, just as a, as a fun example, since we're talking about hibernators, I put in uh, the fat from a bear in the fall. And you can see that the, the level of saturated fat in the bear is similar to that in the obese American, although the bear does accumulate more polyunsaturated fat than the obese American does. But uh, the obese American is 27% saturated and bear fat is only 25%. So the obese American looks somewhere like half halfway between a normal American in 1962 and an actual bear getting ready to hibernate, right? That's our, that's where our fat saturation level is. Um, and so this is just a few examples. I wrote a much longer article on, about this in my blog recently, but this is a basic metabolic rate. This, this, um, and this is uh, calories per day that you burn per kilogram of fat free mass, right? So they, they subtract out the, your weight that is fat, and then you get this number. This 32 is based on my estimation from an, a famous equation, the Harris-Benedict equation that came out in 1919 that would predict, based on your height, weight, um, gender, and age, it would predict uh, how many calories you should, your sort of basal metabolic rate would be. And that's metabolic rate when you're basically like reclining first thing in the morning on a, on a bed or on a couch, just lying there. Um, and so uh, it's somewhere around 32. Um, as calculated in 1919 from sort of normal Americans. Um, this 27.1, these are people who are in the biggest loser contest. So these are people who are very obese and they go on the show to try to lose weight. And when um, obese Americans, uh, who of course have lots of polyunsaturated fat, high levels of SCD1, um, when they starve themselves to win a game show, um, 
what happens is their metabolic rate drops, you know, just like the squirrels, when we fasted the squirrels who had eaten all the polyunsaturated fat, their metabolic rate drops so that they can enter torpor. And it turns out obese Americans do the same thing. So if you're an obese human who, and in this number, this 27.1, this was taken six years after those contestants um, were on that show. So an obese American, severe caloric restriction can reduce your metabolic rate for at least six years. We don't really know how long. Um, Conversely, this 40.8, uh, these are uh, female Thai rice farmers. Um, and so like I was saying, uh, starch eating cultures have very saturated fat and they have very high metabolic rates. Um, I just looked at studies from rice farmers from Thailand, uh, Korea, um, Laos, and they all have, you know, uh, BMRs of 36 to 37 and higher. Um, and and so that, you know, is just another kind of data point that uh, the, the Tsimani forger farmers who live in Bolivia and eat manioc also have really high metabolic rates. Um, and so this is just this enzyme SCD1. Uh, you can see that the more this is body mass index. So the more obese you are, the more SCD1 you make. This is one of the strongest correlations I've ever seen between like a real actual thing and real actual humans, right? Like this is a direct correlation. There's no, you don't need to be a statistician uh, to see the correlation here, right? Um, the more obese you are, the more SCD one you make kind of period. Um, so I think that's interesting. Um, is there a life stat? I'm gonna come back to this one. Um, I want to talk about the banana milkshake study. I've mentioned that the thing that is sort of specifically as, as one becomes obese, the thing that is specifically lost is stearic acid due to the upregulation of SCD1. And, um, and so there was an article that came out, I believe it was 2018, um, where people were taking a banana milkshake and they were adding like 25 grams of supplemental stearic acid. And what happens is these are, these are their mitochondria. This is, I believe from white blood cells. Um, in this, slide on the left. I'm not great with left and right. Forgive me if I get it wrong. Um, and the slide on what I'm pretty sure is the left. Um, these mitochondria, th these humans were given uh, like a vegan low fat diet for two days. And then they did the stearic acid shake. And after the two day vegan diet, you can see that the mitochondria are fragmented. Um, they're not in any kind of long method or long networks. And all the way on the right, this is, I think, six hours after the, the stearic acid milkshake. Now all the mitochondria have fused into these long networks of mitochondria. And there's other data in the paper um, suggesting that um, uh, suggesting that these people are indeed burning more fat. Um, they are more readily burning fat due to this stearic acid. And they claim that there's something special about stearic acid versus palmitic acid, which is a 16 carbon saturated fat, which, you know, sort of should be very similar to stearic acid and how it behaves, but, but they argue that it's special. And so, um, I just want to go back and consider this question, uh, for a second. This, I wake up thinking about this question. Is there a lipostat? Um, and the idea here is that if indeed this fattening process, remember the squirrels that were unable to hibernate and would presumably have perished um, because they didn't eat enough linoleic acid, um, that suggests that this, this process of fattening, this process of a torpid metabolism is, a, is an evolutionary conserved one that is, you know, once you begin going down that path, it is the prerogative of that animal to continue to go down that path, right? Um, the squirrel has to get fat and it has to upregulate SCD1 and it has to unsaturate its fat for winter. And so when you look at it from that perspective, then what type of fats are circulating in the blood can act as a marker to the cells of the body. Like, what are we doing? Are we fattening? Um, or, you know, do we have a whole store of food and we should be, you know, uh, partying and having sex, right. And, and reproducing, um, and so the animal has to look for signals in the, in the blood and one potential signal in the blood is going to be, um, well, what I'm referring to as a lipostat, the cells can monitor what types of fats are circulating. And in the event that the animal is torpid, um, what you would expect to see is relatively high palmitic acid, which is the first end product of denopo lipogenesis, 
um, high oleic acid, which is the end product of genophospholipogenesis plus SCD1, and relatively high linoleic acid, which is presumably the dietary trigger that started the torpor in the first place. And on the other hand, you'd have very low stearic acid. Um, so, so, right. So when you see high stearic acid circulating in the blood, that sort of looks like not torpor to the animal. And I, I wonder if that is why uh, we see some of the results that people have seen with stearic acid in the banana milkshake study, et cetera. Okay. Uh, that's a theoretical basis. We're going to get on to the molecular reasons for all of this. And I'm going to go pretty fast through this, um, because it's boring, <laughs> but it's important. So I'm going to say it and I'm going to put the slides up. Um, if you guys really want to dig into this, the two, if you want to look at my blog, the two best articles to start on are, um, the ROS theory of obesity part three, and it's a two part article. The first one is called ROS is a therm is a thermogenic loop. And the second one is called, um, obesity as a global succinate dehydrogenase deficiency. Um, and most of this science is, is in those two articles. Um, but I'm going to kind of rip through this. Um, so, okay. So this is, um, the, the first thing that you have to understand is that saturated fat make more reactive oxygen species than do unsaturated fats. That really is the key to how all of this works. And that's why my theories are called the ROS theory of obesity. ROS are free radicals. Um, yeah, no one likes that word. It's scary. Um, ROS can do oxidative damage. It's true. Um, but it seems like the system is also designed around them and, and, um, people call them a signaling molecule. I don't even think that says it well enough. I think they are a fundamental part of the system and how it all works. And so what we have in this, in this diagram are, um, it's, it's muscle fibers out of a rat, uh, leg, um, rat muscles. And, and it's cultured with, um, the black bars are just glucose and the white bars are, they have additional palmitic acid, which is a 16 carbon saturated fat. And then as you go from uh, left to right, <laughs> um, there's increasing amount of polyunsaturated fat. And so you see that the muscle with glucose and saturated fat makes by far the, mar the most ROS. And then the more you add of polyunsaturated fat, the lower and lower the, um, the, the superoxide production goes or the ROS production goes, right? Um, that's the thing. So saturated fat makes more, um, ROS than polyunsaturated fat. And the reason is that, um, there's more input to something called complex two, AKA succinate dehydrogenase. Um, this is the mitochondrial electron transport chain. Again, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. All I want you to see is that, uh, there's a complex one and there's a complex two and electrons from both of them have to move through this coenzyme Q. Um, it's a bottleneck, plain and simple. Um, and so when you have a lot of enzyme or a lot of electrons coming in through complex one and the electrons are moving this way, and you also have a lot of electrons coming in through um, complex two, aka succinate dehydrogenase, uh, coenzyme Q simply can't hold that many electrons. It gets overwhelmed and the electrons ping back out and form ROS. Um, that is the nutshell version of how this all works. And every time there's an unsaturated bond, you have one less electron or really one pair less electrons moving in through complex two. And so you have less ROS being produced every time there's an unsaturated bond. So saturated fat drives ROS production via complex two via succinate dehydrogenase activity. Okay. We're almost there. Um, unsaturated fats decrease succinate dehydrogenase activity. Bang. Now this part is, this is the last sort of technical slide I'm going to spend a lot of time on and I'm trying to move my face out of the way and sort of failing. Um, well, it doesn't matter. We'll put it right here. That's fine. Um, so, so this chart, um, this is really important. Um, so one of the things that we need to run our metabolism is something called NAD plus, um, NAD plus is an electron carrier. So when we, when we burn our food, we're really just 
stripping electrons from it. That's the redox way of looking at metabolism. And the electrons have to go somewhere. And every, you know, we break fat down, we break ethanol down, we break glucose down into something called acetyl-CoA. And there's these little acetyl-2 carbon groups. And for every acetyl group, we need three NAD plus molecules to carry the electrons up to the electron transport chain. And so the more, basically the more NAD plus we have, the faster that we can run our metabolism. And, um, and so these are this 1.0, this is a wild type, normal mouse eating a low fat diet. That's just kind of like the baseline NAD plus that a mouse would have. Right. And then this black bar, which is like, has four times the amount of NAD plus as the wild type, these are the mice who don't have SCD1. So they have very, very saturated fat. And because they have very saturated fat, these are the ones with whose metabolic rates are 40 to 50% faster than normal mice. And they have huge amounts of NAD plus. Um, so that's really important. And we'll see why that is, um, like I say, briefly. Um, and then if you give those same mice lacking SCD1 a high fat diet, and the composition of that high fat diet is over here, at least they don't tell us the actual breakdown of PUFA versus MUFA versus saturated fat. But um, I, this summer sent in, or last summer, I guess, sent in um, samples of Smithfield bacon fat. Um, and it had about 17 to 18% polyunsaturated fat. The USDA database says uh, pork fat has 10% polyunsaturated fat, but most commercial pork has far more polyunsaturated fat than that. And so if this diet was based on mostly lard with some soybean oil added to it, um, only about 10% soybean oil, mostly it was lard. And so if you assume those numbers, the fat they were using was similar to the Smithfield bacon that I had, uh, what they were giving them was 60% of their calories as fat, 20% of which was polyunsaturated fat. And so that puts them well over that kind of 8% threshold that we've talked about. These product guys are probably getting 12% PUFA and not a lot of saturated fat. And anyways, given a lot of very unsaturated fat like this, you can see that the NAD plus goes from being, you know, almost four times baseline down to only maybe 80% of baseline. And so here you see a very direct effect of polyunsaturated fat causing reductive stress. Um, reductive stress just means that you look at um, NAD, NAD plus and NADH are said to be a redox couple. Um, and if all of the NADH is oxidized, uh, then it will... NAD plus is the oxidized form and NADH is the reduced form. So if it's all reduced, if it's all NADH um, and there's not enough NAD plus, that is said to be reductive stress. And reductive stress causes all kinds of problems and it definitely slows down your metabolic rate. Um, and so you can see over here, uh, this black bar, which only is making perhaps half the NAD plus of a normal mouse, these mice have SCD1 overexpressed in their muscle tissues. And so these, mi these mice look very much like an obese human, um, make lots of SCD1, and they are in absolute reductive stress. They simply do not have enough um, NAD+, and they have too much NADH. And so, so you can see very directly in this experiment that, um, you know, the, the sort of redox balance of the cell is directly uh, controlled by how saturated the fat is. Um, again, this, these mice have the most saturated fat and the most NAD plus, you know, these mice over here with, that are overexpressing SCD1 and are also given lots of PUFA in their diet, they have the least um, NAD plus and you can see all the levels in the middle. And so how does that work? Well, it turns out there's this enzyme. Uh, it is called um, nicotinamide nucleotide transhydrogenase. <laughs> Nailed it. Um, <laughs> I practiced that one. Um, and so these ROS, what happens is there's something called glutathione, which converts the hydrogen peroxide back to water. And, um, and when it does that, glutathione reductase is then there to convert the now oxidized glutathione back to reduced glutathione so that it can go eliminate another molecule of hydrogen peroxide. 
And every time it does that, it uses a molecule of NADP plus. And this uh, NNT enzyme uh, transfers the hydrogen group, the hyd hydride ion really, from NADH onto NADP plus, giving us NADPH and NAD plus. And so this is the molecular mechanism by which the cell uses to regenerate NAD plus from ROS. We've already seen that saturated fat drives the most ROS. And every time you have a molecule of ROS, you can get an NAD plus back. And we've also seen that animals with the most saturated fat have the most NAD plus. And we've seen that animals with the highest level of NAD plus have the highest metabolic rate. Um, and this is just, this is, uh, this is our metabolic rate. You've got fat and glucose coming into the mitochondria. They're standing in line to go on the, the merry-go-round. And there's a sign here that says you must have three NAD plus to ride because the acetyl-CoA groups are not going to, they're not going to be able to go through the citric acid cycle if they don't have three NAD plus available. And of course you get the NAD plus by generating ROS. And so I've got some, uh, just a bunch of different examples of this in real life action. So this is succinate. Remember I said complex two is really succinate dehydrogenase. And so you can drive ROS at succinate dehydrogenase simply by feeding um, succinate, which is a byproduct of glucose metabolism, or it's also a byproduct of fat metabolism, um, to mice. So if you give them a bunch of succinate, um, it will drive ROS and their metabolic rate increases. The blue line, of course, is the mice given the succinate. And you can see that throughout the day, they are burning more oxygen. 2% um, uh, succinate as the sort of calories in the diet um, also causes pretty dramatic weight loss in mice because they are, they're burning more calories, right? And, and the ROS causes all of these changes like higher muscle mass, et cetera. Um, and the mice get ripped and it's the same number of calories. Um, yeah, pair fed means the calories are equal in the two groups. Um, uh, NNT increases metabolic rate. So here we have, there's these mice called black six mice, mice and they, they, everybody uses them in obesity research because it's really easy to make them fat. And one of the reasons that they're fat is that they lost in, in the lab at Jackson Harbor, um, they actually lost the gene NNT. Um, it was literally deleted and it was just a genetic mutation that happened to them. And so they're, they came from the six N mice. So they're incredibly closely related to six N mice. Um, but they're except for the lack of NNT. And you can see this is, uh, this is again, oxygen consumption. The light cycle is when mice are, they sleep during the daytime, they're nocturnal. And so you can see that, especially when they're sleeping, the mice lacking, uh, NNT, they have a lower metabolic rate. And if you look all the way to the right, um, the mice lacking NNT, their body fat content goes from like 8% up to like 14%. Um, and so you see real world consequences of the inability to regenerate NNT or regenerate NAD plus from ROS, right? Um, and here's another example. I'm going to move my face out of the way again, if I can figure out how. I, well, yesterday I was good at this. Anyway, um, uh, so this is just, um, this, this first chart is a, um, this is a human cell. So now we're in human cell line, uh, not, you know, live humans, but you can see the control that black bar is um, the amount of NAD in the normal cells and the green bar, uh, they added extra NNT. So those cells are overexpressing NNT. They have tons of it. And you can see there, the amount of NAD they have available goes way up. And the orange bar is um, those cells with a, um, a antisense RNA and it, and it reduces the amount of NNT that they make and they have less NAD+. Um, we'll come back to the sirtuins, but they are enzymes that keep your mitochondria, they're enzymes that keep your mitochondrial enzymes free of acetyl groups, which is like kind of like rust and it basically turns them off. Um, but the more, but they rely on NAD plus to function. And so um, the more NAD plus there is, the more NNT activity there is, uh, the more active CERT3 is and the less NNT active is, the least active the CERT3 is. And this over here is again, oxygen consumed. So this is metabolic rate. So um, black are the normal cell lines. 
the ones that make extra NNT and have more NAD and have more CERT3 have a high metabolic rate and the ones um, with less NNT, less NAD, less CERT3 have a lower metabolic rate. And again, these are human tissue cultures. Um, and so we can say the unsaturated path leads to reductive stress and de novo lipogenesis and the saturated path leads to oxidative balance and fat burning. And then the final thing I want to talk about on the teculinal side is that ultimately, as we saw in the squirrel, right, the squirrel was eating PUFA to hibernate for winter. And while it was doing that, it upregulated SCD1. And so you were just getting this global increase in unsaturation, right, from all sides. And, um, and, and so, uh, and this is tied into that enzyme cert three. I was just talking about, um, if you don't have enough NAD plus, um, cert three can't do its job. Cert three needs NAD plus it's a cofactor. It can't work without it. And so if cert three isn't, isn't acting, um, and like I say, if there's not much NAD plus around, what happens is those acetyl groups build up cause they don't have three NAD plus to go on the ride. Right. And so, um, as the acetyl groups build up, um, your mitochondrial enzymes come what they call acetylated. Um, the acetyl groups literally just start to stick onto the, to the uh, mitochondrial enzymes and they stop functioning. And so now you can't make ATP, you can't, and, and the acetyl groups just keep building up and there's no NAD plus. So, so the CERT3 are not there deacetylating those enzymes. And interestingly, um, when you inactivate CERT3, what happens is SCD1 goes up. Um, and that can be shown really clearly in a, in, a, in a mouse model again. But you see this positive feedback loop of unsaturated fat leading to low NAD+, leading to low CERT3 activity, leading to high SCD1 activity, which makes your fat even that much less saturated. And so that is, that's sort of the basis of the positive feedback loop um, that keeps us torpid, right? The organism has decided to become torpid and the biochemistry is doing everything it can to keep us torpid, right? That's its job because we have to, we have to survive winter, remember. Um, um, anyway, and so um, this is just the, this is the mouse. Um, this is a mouse who lacks, this is SCD1 level. Uh, these are mice um, who who don't have CERT3. And so you can see when you feed them a little bit of fat, um, which is going to be unsaturated fat, the SCD1 levels just explode um, because they're trying to get torpid, right? Um, this is another way uh, complex two is uh, succinate dehydrogenase. Um, you can see there's a lot of parallels between uh, obese humans. Um, this chart here is obese humans. And you can see compared to lean humans, they have half the succinate dehydrogenase ability or activity level, I should say. This is a hibernating animal. And you can see compared to a non-hibernating animal, this would be the same animal in the summer season when they're active. This is the same animal in the winter. And you can see they have less than half of the succinate dehydrogenase activity. Um, and now this is obesity. So these are, these are obese humans. And um, you can see that um, this here is complex one activity. So this is mitochondrial enzymes, uh, you know, and they're way less active in the obese people because the obese people are under reductive stress. CERT3 is not active and the enzymes are just not doing their job. And therefore they have low levels of ATP, which is ironic because now you have an organism which has tons of energy available to it, right? The organism has tons of organismal energy, but yet low cellular energy. Um, and that's sort of ironic, right? If you're like, if I have all this extra energy, why don't I feel energetic? Why don't I want to jump up and run around? Well, it's because you're in reductive stress and your mitochondrial enzymes are acetylated and you don't actually have ATP in your cells, which you actually need to, um, you know, to get up and do things, right? And so that is that's kind of the great irony. And so this slide is complicated. Um, and the reason I put it up here is I want to show people ask me, okay, well, if, if polyunsaturated fat causes obesity, then why isn't everybody fat? Right. And so this is sort of showing this complicated interaction between, um, a whole bunch of both, um, internal genetic factors and also, um, 
environmental factors that are affecting whether or not the initial consumption of linoleic acid will ultimately upregulate SCD1 and turn into this sort of full-blown torpid metabolism. And so linoleic acid comes in. That's the starting material. The more linoleic acid you have, the more um, that these enzymes D5D and D6D are going to have around. And what they do is they are the limiting factors in the creation of arachidonic acid. And so when you look at genetic factors, D5D and D6D, absolutely, if you have high levels of these uh, enzymes, it absolutely uh, seems causative of uh, diabetes as determined by this kind of study called uh, Mendelian randomization. Um, so that, that's a, that's a, that is good evidence that D5D and D6D are actually causal of, of diabetes and metabolic syndrome. And what they do is they convert linoleic acid to arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid is converted by something called cytochrome P450s into oxalams, which are oxidized linoleic acid metabolites. And they trigger something called PPAR gamma, which triggers this other thing called that P, and they ultimately upregulate SCD1. Well, where do the P450s come from? They come from, they're often upregulated by the nuclear receptor superfamily, including AHR, which is the aryl hydrocarbon receptor, which is often triggered by things called PCBs, which are forever chemicals, which are in our drinking water, they're in meat, they're in milk, they're in uh, vegetables. Um, and then uh, another thing, uh, BPA, which is an, a chemical in plastic, triggers another uh nuclear receptor called SXR, also sometimes called PXR. Uh, they also upregulate cytochrome P450s and make these oxalams, and ultimately those things are triggering SCD1. And so um, this is just more evidence of this. Uh, this cool experiment where they made obese mice and they blocked the AHR, that nuclear receptor, and fixed the obesity in the mice. Pretty neat. And so yeah, I, I want to just pause for a second on this the this topic, and then I'm going to move on to talking about uh, pig fat, which should be fun for everyone, hopefully. Um, uh, one of the reasons, so the reason for, I believe, for the heterogeneity of response to PUFA in the diet is that it is it really is complex. Um, you've got these genetic factors like D5D and D6D that I already mentioned, but others like how active is your air aisle hydrocarbon receptor. I know from 23 and me, I have an active version of it. Um, and then that, it says something like, Oh, you will probably metabolize coffee quickly. And I've drank huge amounts of coffee. So it all kind of lines up. Right. Um, and then, you know, these environmental toxins, you know, BPA and plastic. I mean, all, think about all the things that we're exposed to, you know, these can all be, uh, these are probably all triggering through these nuclear super receptor families, um, and so, and also there's a lot of evidence that of course the, um, like there's another study that, um, the, the BMI or yeah, the BMI of the baby, um, is directly affected by the stearic acid to oleic acid, um, content of the mother's maternal blood. So that basically if you're making a lot of this SCD1, um, you know, even after they control for things like blood glucose and, um, and, and other, you know, other factors in the mom, insulin levels, um, that, that high, uh, SCD one level is basically transferred on directly to the next generation. And so, you know, a lot of this obviously comes down to time of exposure. If you were exposed as a young person, it's probably much worse than if you're exposed as an adult, and I say at the end here, linoleic acid accumulation is a superpower. I say that somewhat jokingly, but it is true that people who don't become obese tend to just accumulate the, the linoleic acid forever without turning on that SCD1 somehow. Uh, and you can especially see that in pigs, and I've got a good example of it. Um, so, I, so let's talk about designer animal fats. We know that animals can't make PUFA. Um, you know, we've seen in the various studies that I've shown fat that's like good that looks like um that looks like the body fat of a lean person with a high metabolism and we've seen fat that's bad that looks like uh you know the fat of a of an obese person or an animal entering torpor etc and so animals can't make pufa um we can control it to a pretty wide extent 
Um, and it's most important in non-ruminants, things like pigs and chickens, because um, cows, their the bugs that live in their rumens will actually saturate vegetable oil if, if we give it to them. And fat from starch is quite saturated, as we saw in the in the uh, Thai rice farmers. Um, and the animal genetics is very important. And I'll, I'll quickly read this. Um, before we can discuss intelligently the production of firm and soft bacon or pork, it is necessary to ascertain the difference in composition between them. We found that the fats of meat are made up of essentially of olein, a fluid fat at ordinary temperatures, and palmitin and stearin, solid fats at ordinary temperatures. And so this is from 1912, the American Cyclopedia of Agriculture. So they're already talking about, oh, um, meat can be soft, which means it can be high in polyunsaturated fat. And they knew back then. And it says, England is the great bacon market and procures most of its product from Denmark, Ireland, Canada, and the US. One fact worthy of consideration is that of these four countries, the bacon from the US sells far less or sells for less per pound than that from the other three countries. So as far back as 1912, um, American bacon was discounted in European markets because it was soft. And why was it soft? It was soft because Americans feed their pigs corn and corn has about twice as much oil as barley and European countries to traditionally finish their pigs with barley. And here it says the finest Danish bacon is made by feeding the right sort of pigs on barley and rye with boiled potatoes, raw turnips, cut fine, skim milk, buttermilk and grass in summer and roots in winter. So there's no um, there's no source of PUFA. There's no large source of PUFA in the traditional Danish pork. Um, this is an example. This is sort of a counter example of that. These are um, modern-ish lean pigs that were fed. They just had like extra sunflower seeds they were trying to get rid of. So they were like, let's feed it to the pigs and see what happens. And um, you can see in this treatment for these pigs were fed 39% of their diet as whole sunflower seeds. And uh, they managed to accumulate 54% linoleic, uh, linoleic acid in their body fat. That is more than soybean oil. So pigs can have more soybean oil than um, than soybeans can, in fact, crazily enough, or more linoleic acid. Um, so I started Fire Brand Meats. We make low poof of pork. We use heritage breeds. Um, we feed them mostly starch and, um, and their fat is mostly saturated. Um, and I'm looking into chicken. It's tricky. Um, I sent in my, my fat for testing. And like I say, I compared it to the Smithfield fat and you can see uh, my linoleic acid is at 6%. Theirs is at almost 16%. My stearic acid is 13 and almost 13 and a half percent. And theirs is below 10. Um, so, you know, to me, that's, that's good. And so this is a comparison of, you know, thinking about your metabolic rate based on the foods that you're putting into your mouth, because of course the fat entering your mitochondria is a combination of your stored body fat and what you just ate in the previous meal. And so you see the, the Smithfield bacon, um, that's a 16.9, um, or 18, 18.9, because this is total PUFA. This is not just linoleic acid. Um, you can see that the firebrand meats, uh, fat profile is extraordinarily similar to the starch eating Nigerian, which is to say it's, it's extraordinarily similar to, um, humans who eat starch and have very high metabolic rates where the Smithfield bacon is much more saturated even than the lean American in 19, or much more unsaturated than even the lean American in 1962, mostly due to its high uh, linoleic acid content. Um, and, you know, this is a fun, uh, there are still, there are still lard based uh, potato chips on the market, which is, I think, a cool area of future. I'd love to make them. Um, but of course, they're all made with uh, the Smithfield lard that you probably don't want to eat. Um, barriers to growth in this market. Well, the biggest one is, um, is the fact that there's no medium scale slaughterhouses. Uh, this is a huge problem. Um, if I raise five pigs and I want to take them somewhere and get them slaughtered, no big deal. Um, if I raise 5,000 pigs and I want to take them and get them slaughtered and process, no big deal. If I raise, uh, 200 pigs, there's nowhere I can go. There's literally nowhere I can go. Um, and so America, this is a, this is just a soapbox issue. I like to get up and talk about as much as I can. And I don't, you know, um, I don't really have a real plan in place. I'm just putting out the feelers, um, hold steady reference for those of you, hold steady fans in the audience. Um, 
<laughs> but um, anyway, uh, it's a problem. So if somebody wants to build a slaughtering meat processing facility, come talk to me. Um, anyway, uh, lastly, I want to say that um, there is this amazing research model called the Asaba hogs. Um, I've raised pigs for 15 years. I like them. I know a lot about them and I've done research in the lab. And so when I kind of think about like, oh, what, what should we do next as a community? I'm like, we need to, we need to do some of this research. Um, and so I, um, right. And so the Asaba pigs are about the same size as humans. They have the same size organs as humans and they will readily become diabetic, obese, and they actually get heart disease. They get, uh, human style heart disease, which almost no other research animal does. And so some cool studies have been done in them, but no one has ever looked at uh, what happens to NAD plus levels in response to a meal of saturated fat versus PUFA? Uh, what if you keep them on this diet for a year? year? What is it? What is what do NADH and NAD plus pools look like in um, lean versus obese uh, swine? Um, th this is a, this is a, another bit of research done in pigs. And these are all different lipogenic genes. And this group is fed tallow and this group is fed high oleic sunflower oil and this group is fed sunflower oil. And you can see that the high oleic sunflower oil and the sunflower oil cause much more lipogenic genes to be produced in pigs than does beef tallow. But again, no one has followed it up with, um, with the research about what is happening uh, on a Redex perspective, what's happening with NAD plus and NADH. And I just think um, there's too much information here to not um, to not continue to pursue this avenue. And I would love to do it and I'm ready to do it. So again, if somebody wants to fund a research agency, come talk to me. <laughs> anyway, um, and these are the kind of things like th this is, I skipped over, sorry, another uh, article that's very interesting. Look up, uh, go to my blog, look for Asaba pigs, and you'll find a really interesting study, uh, feeding study. And um, those are the things we should be researching, in my opinion. Um, so I want to thank uh, Dr. Anthony Gustin for having me here. Um, I want to thank Karen for helping put this all together. Uh, I, of course, want to thank uh, Peter Dropper Milsky, who is, uh, writes the blog Hyperlipid and who has really um, uh, informed a lot of my research. Um, uh, I want to thank Ada Vivo. She made all the silly illustrations on my blog and that you saw in this slideshow. Um, I wake up at like 3 AM and usually like sketch something on the back of like a paper towel and like send her a photo. And then she makes it into the carnival scene. Uh, I want to thank Amber O'Hearn. She's just a good friend and a good mentor. Um, and I will now put the references up. Um, they're obviously kind of small and I'm just gonna, uh, leave them here briefly in case anyone wants to screenshot these and chase down these studies. Um, and I thank you all for listening and hopefully you learned something and, um, thank you for watching.